today I'm going to discuss the Polish underground uh, resistance movement during World War II uh, and its reaction and attitude uh, to the Jews, the Holocaust, and the uh, Jewish resistance movement. Let me first start by saying how I got interested in this topic. It began with an undergraduate course I took on the Holocaust uh, uh, in which a student rose up and made the claim that when Jews fled the ghettos and camps and tried to survive on the Aryan side, uh, Poles were as dangerous to them as the Germans, and in particular, Polish partisans in the forest. Now, I had no background in the topic, and to me, it appeared somewhat illogical. Poles and Jews shared the same mortal enemy. They were under ruthless German occupation. Uh, thousands upon thousands of Poles had been uh, executed, imprisoned, uh, m murdered. Uh, there were uh, three to 400,000 uh, Polish POWs in German camps. Uh, and uh, they obviously shared the same enemy as uh, uh, the Jews and uh, uh, aspired to the same broad general end, which was the destruction of the, of the a Nazi state uh, and the restoration of a free uh, and uh, liberal uh, Poland and democratic Poland. Uh, as I uh, began to read on the topic, I realized that the majority of Jewish Holocaust uh, testimonies um, had a consensus uh, that the Polish underground was uh, hostile to the Jews. So this is where the background I had when I first visited Poland um, as an undergraduate student. It was part of a European-wide tour. I wanted to see Auschwitz and Treblinka and Majdanek. After having taken that course, I wanted to see it with my own eyes. Um, that particular experience had a profound impact on me because there I just happened to meet some Polish people uh, who uh, spoke uh, English. And uh, in conversation with them, I realized that there was like an English channel-wide gulf between the perce two perceptions. From their point of view, Poles, when possible, aided Jews, uh, and Poles themselves were victims. The idea that Poles as victims victimize others was, uh, was profoundly uh, uh, objected to. Uh, and there was a claim that there really was no anti-Semitism among Poles in Poland, that the Polish underground were heroes and martyrs of a resistance movement allied with the Western democracies to defeat Nazi Germany, and that many Polish uh, underground soldiers perished in that effort. That gulf between the two peoples and understandings. On the one hand, Jews regarding the Polish underground as endemically anti-Semitic and hostile, and on the other hand, the Poles regarding it as heroes and martyrs of freedom and democracy who, when possible, came to the aid of Jews, uh, made me, uh, uh, led me to the decision uh, to start a research project on this, to kind of reopen the subject. So what I did is I began reading all the secondary sources I could find uh, uh, when I, uh, uh, by the time I entered graduate school, I already had a working knowledge of Polish. So I could read Polish secondary sources um, and Jewish uh, secondary sources. Uh, and uh, again, it solidified this uh, consensus among Jews and among Poles that were opposite. And so I decided to reopen the topic and begin, uh, begin a kind of uh, archival research project and a, a book project. And so I uh, end up traveling to various countries, England, Poland, uh, Israel, Switzerland, uh, various archives in New York, including uh, the YIVO Institute, um, but also the New York Public Library, and also uh, the very important um, uh, research institutes in California. And as I began to read more and more and then get funding for uh, going back to look at archives, uh, I realized that in fact the issue was more complex, that actually there were both um, uh, individuals in the Polish underground and actually organizations dedicated to aiding Jews. And so that's where this really began. Now let me start by defining what is, quote, the Polish underground resistance movement and its military wing, the Home Army. I think it's 
very little understood uh, by English reading, uh, by the English reading public. It's a very broad and abstract term. What does it mean, the Polish underground, the Polish resistance? Very little understanding, there's very little understanding. So I wanna begin with this, that uh, when World War II began on September 1st, 1939, the then ruling Polish government was openly anti-Semitic. Their policy, it was called the Sanatia regime, was uh, openly that the vast majority of Jews should leave Poland. There were at the time in place uh, quotas on Jews in universities. Um, although not government policy, three universities in Poland were allowed to introduce something called ghetto benches in 1937, which meant that Jewish students had to sit in the last two rows of the classrooms. Um, and that meant that, and Jewish students and their and Poles who sympathized with them protested by standing during classes. And outside those classrooms and outside those buildings were anti-Semitic youths uh, who would uh, um, who would harass Jews. We know that three Jewish students were killed between 1937 and 1938 at the Lwów uh, University and Polytechnic. So it was a hostile environment with the government that is saying that the solution to quote what they called the Jewish problem was mass emigration. You know, uh, paradoxically, that meant that they were avidly pro-Zionist, so that the Polish government favored territorial solutions. Um, and ironically, they were the first uh, government to officially protest the British White Paper in 1939. Now, I'm speaking about this because very few people know that there is no continuity between the Polish government of pre-World War II and the uh, bodies of the Polish government in exile and underground. And why is that? Because 17 days after the German invasion of Soviet Russia, the Polish government fled the country through a small southeastern border with Romania. They abandoned the country. Now, on the 1st of September, they had informed the public that they are battle ready that the Polish army can defend itself against the Germans. So they underestimated the German strength and they overestimated Polish military strength. And when the government fled, it became universally discredited in Poland as having failed the population, fled to Romania, uh, uh, and, um, and is no longer a credible body representing Poland. Now, what was the policy in Romania at the time? Romania did not want to be a party of the government. So what they did is they interned or arrested all members of the Polish government because they believed that if they allowed that Polish government to go on to the Western world, France or England, that Germany would regard Romania as a party to the conflict. So what they did is they interned the president, the commander in chief of the armed forces, all government officials, but anybody who was not part of the ruling coalition was allowed to go through Romania and on to the West. So, at the end of September 1939, members of the Polish opposition parties, those who opposed the ruling party, gathered in Paris and on the 30th of September 1939, proclaimed the Polish government in exile. Within a month, France officially recognized it, United Kingdom, United States, Belgium, Denmark, all the major countries. Let me begin by saying that it's important that we understand who were these members of the Polish opposition who uh, now formed the new representative body in Paris. We're gonna go to slide one. Now slide one, it's table five, it's called official pronouncements of the major opposition parties on the Jewish question between 1936 to 1939. It's very important for us to understand who were these people who now represented Poland, who rejected the pre-war government that had just fallen, openly castigated it as, as anti-Semitic and anti-democratic, and now would herald in a new age for Poland, an age of pluralism, democracy, freedom. Uh, the Polish uh, government was formed essentially of, of five pre-war parties. Uh, that's the Polish government in Paris, 
that established itself in 1939. So what this chart shows is that it was composed of, on the left, the Polish Socialist Party, which had a platform, which I discuss in my book, um, that was openly pro-Western, openly condemnatory of anti-Semitism, openly condemnatory of the ruling uh, government, and called for full equality of the Jews. It called for openly combating anti-Semitism, right? And they rejected all other. And the Polish Socialist Party was the principal party on the left. They probably, at their height, got about 29 to 30 percent of the popular vote. Now, next to them was something called the Democratic Party. They also, like the Polish Socialist Party, favored equal rights for Jews. They openly condemned anti-Semitism. Both of these parties had Jews in them, by the way, and they rejected any what we may today call anti-democratic principles, like, for example, promoting some legal restrictions on Jews, or, for example, promoting voluntarily, voluntary mass emigration of Jews, forced emigration of Jews, revoking Jewish citizens. These are the most extreme that I'll go through. And then in the center was the Peasant Party, which was very popular because we should remember that Poland was an agricultural country. Still, 51% of the population were employed in agriculture by 1939. And the Peasant Party was a, was a, a major force. They were in the opposition. Um, now, they had slightly different views. Um, which is that they were for full equality of civil rights, but they didn't openly condemn anti-Semitism uh, in their platform, uh, but nevertheless, um, they believed that all citizens had equal civil rights, uh, not just ethnic Poles, for example. Now, to the center right, if we had a centrist peasant party, there was the party of labor, which was what we call center right. And there, uh, it was represented by um, someone named Vladislav Sikorsky, who was actually in exile uh, at this in the 19, late 1930s. He would become the prime minister of Poland on September 30th, 1939. A very critical, important figure. He would be named both both prime minister of Poland and commander in chief of the armed forces. It's probably confusing to some, what does it mean to be commander of an armed force of a country that doesn't exist anymore? Meaning they are now under German and Russian occupation. Uh, and that, what happened uh, is that of those Poles who went into exile, there were soldiers. And so they were allowed under French auspices and later British uh, to form their own party that would be under in general, British command or French command, but they'd have local Polish commanders and they'd be part of the Allied forces fighting Nazi Germany. Uh, and so they were important. Now in, in the 1930s, their position on the Jews uh, was, um, was, was actually rather, uh, maybe say populist. For example, at that time, in the late 1930s, they did favor some legal restrictions on Jews. And they actually, in their party platform, favored uh, mass emigration of Jews. Voluntary, of course, but they were of the opinion that they expressed that there are too many Jews in Poland and, uh, and it, that this excess should be eliminated through voluntary emigration to Palestine. That was their view. We should recall here that Poland had the world's largest uh, percentage of Jews, second largest Jewish population in the world next to the United States, the largest in Europe. One in every three European Jews lived within the boundaries of Poland. 3.2 million Jews, 10% uh, of the population. And, and so the party of labor would have said, you know, that's, that, that's just too many Jews. So we believe that it would be better for them and us if they follow the Zionist dream and emigrate to Palestine and work on forming a Jewish state. Now, to the right of party of labor was what we'll call the right-wing populist party that was openly anti-Semitic, and they did not actually have a place in the ruling coalition. They were called the National Party. Uh, they had been controlled uh, and uh, led by someone named Roman Domofsky, who was the head of this party, who actually died in 1939, so he was succeeded by his kind of like deputy leader of the party, uh, but they, they were an openly anti-Semitic party. They favored some legal restrictions on Jews, 
Um, and in fact, their most extreme wing uh, in that party uh, in 1938 and 1939 actually said they were for forced emigration of Jews and there were members of the party that openly called for the revocation of Jewish citizenship. Now that was a minority within the party, but it gives you a sense of now the makeup of the government in exile, right? It's led by someone of the party of labor who now seeing the rise of anti-Semitism in Germany and that Germany now controls 60% of Poland, uh, rejects those, those policies that could be conceived as anti-Semitic and he redirects the Polish government in a very new, uh, new way, which is that he now becomes a friendly force. Uh, for example, uh, in November, he, he visits a major synagogue in Paris, um, uh, and um, it was commented uh, at the time in the New York Times, November 1939, that it was inconceivable that a member of the pre-war government would have uh, visited a synagogue and made friendly remarks um, to the Jews and, um, and, and reinforce his belief in, in absolute equality of the Jews um, um, after the war. Now, let's just put this uh, uh, in more context. Now that they're in Paris, France, right, throughout the war, uh, and actually when France in 1940 gets uh, uh, or occupied by Germany, that Polish government exile flees to England. And for the rest of the war, 1940 to 1945, they reside in London. Now, being in London, this government in exile is very aware that they have to harmonize their views with the West. They cannot be openly anti-Jewish. They cannot, uh, they cannot uh, even, they cannot even be ambiguous about whether or not they're they're uh, in favor of unambiguously Jewish civil rights after the war. Now, because of that, and because of the concerns expressed uh, by uh, some Western American Jews, British Jews, uh, about that, um, on three occasions, the Polish government exile um, declares uh, in uh, officially, uh, they pronounce that they are unambiguously in favor of full Jewish civil rights after the war, and this Polish government in exile uh, has also a parliament in exile called the National Council. And on that, they place two Jewish, uh, Polish Jews, um, who, Schwarzbart, who represents the Zionist party, and Ziegelboim, who represents the Jewish Socialist Bund, and they become official members of the Polish parliament in exile for most of the war. Uh, and the Polish government exile actually um, throughout the war, um, uh, warns the world about uh, the emerging uh, Holocaust and actually puts forth plans to save Jews. So that's going on in, in the West, the Polish government exile. They're now allies officially with the Western democracies and they're promoting democratic ideals, rejecting pre-war authoritarian forms of government. Now, how does that relate to the Polish underground? And that is, that at the same time that the Polish government in exile formed in Paris, October, September, October 1939, in Warsaw, under German occupation, the, those members of the military who remained formed a secret clandestine army that would be plain clothes in the day and trained at night. Uh, and they came under a, an official military formation uh, in which they had a commander, they had deputy commanders, uh, they, uh, uh, they had units spread throughout occupied Poland um, by district uh, of the state, and they swore allegiance to the Polish government in exile in Paris, then in, in London. And now why is that significant? Because in 1939, let's say by the end of that year, when Poland was under dual occupation, Soviet, uh, and German. Uh, an underground was not able to form in the Soviet part, um, but in, in Germany, there were, we believe, about a hundred separate undergra clandestine Polish armed organizations. So it's important to know that what happened with the, the official Polish underground, which called themselves the Home Army, is by 1940, they declared that they are the official representatives of Poland, in, uh, in under occupation, 
uh, and that they are the sole legal body uh, representing the Polish military underground, swearing allegiance to the, gov the government exile in Paris. And they said any other organization is not recognized and not legal. And so what this means is that because, because of those declarations, it means they had no control over far-right extremists who were armed and openly anti-Semitic, and those would maintain an existence throughout the war. For example, uh, throughout the war, there was something called the National Armed Forces, NSZ, that was openly anti-Semitic. They refused to swear allegiance to the Polish government in exile. They refused to swear allegiance to um, the Polish uh, Home Army, their command. And yet, and they did uh, uh, put out pronouncements against Jews, they did attack Jews, and they did kill Jews. Now, in the West, these actions were confused as the anti-Semitic actions of the home army, right? Which actually were not, because they weren't under command. These were like, it'd be the equivalent of like in the American armed forces, if we're abroad and there's a, a war and there's a renegade force that then commits crimes, but uh, they, but not under command of the American Armed Forces, or is the American Army responsible for that? Uh, that's a question uh, we, we could ask. Or if it was just you know the renegade activities of a local unit, for example. So they remained uh, in force in the Home Army, kept trying to acquire them or try to incorporate them to, to soften uh, their, their policies and actually to work against their extremist policies. Okay, now I'd like to go to a chart just so we understand um, about this underground. So maybe what I'd like to add is that, is that even though there had been 100 uh, disparate uh, armed uh, uh, clandestine organizations, eventually the vast majority merged with the, Polish un with the Polish Home Army. And that meant that by 1944, the Polish Home Army was the largest clandestine force, not only in Poland, but actually in occupied Europe. But in, but in occupied Poland, three in, of every four underground clandestine fighters fought under the banner of the Home Army. That meant that tw about 25% represented these extremist radicals on the right. And then the other, the other part of that story is on the extreme left, which is that in 1942, Polish communists formed their own underground. And they swore allegiance not to London, because the government exile was at that time in London, but they swore allegiance to Moscow, that's to say to the Soviet Union, where uh, was located the headquarters of this Polish Communist Party and their underground militia. Now, to illustrate what I have been talking about, I have two charts to show you, both of which are in my book. The first one is looking at the main structure of the Polish underground state uh, with special reference uh, uh, to what was what we'll call the c civilian administration, and I know it gets confusing, but I do want to uh, I do want to explain this that there were there were two there were actually three uh, um, wings of the Polish underground state. So the first one was the Home Army, which is the military, wing. but there was also a civilian wing called the government delegate, and essentially is that in London the prime minister appointed his representative in Warsaw, and his title was government delegate, but he could also be called the deputy prime minister of Poland. And in this chart, what it shows is that he headed what was called a delegates bureau, and it was almost like a underground government that would, that would take power once Poland becomes free. The delegates bureau had different offices, um, and uh, among them were things like, for example, internal affairs, there was information uh, and, the, and, and the press, there was education, social welfare, uh, justice system, there were underground courts for collaborators, for example, there were public works, national defense, things like that. And, um, and that delegate was an important figure because he was considered the highest official in the Polish underground. All Western aid to the Polish underground, financial aid, went through the government delegate. Now, we're going to speak a little bit later about how the government delegate uh, decided in 1942 to create a Jewish aid organization. In other words, as it was becoming clear 
that Nazi Jewish policy in 1942 was being transformed from emigrationism, that's say the mass expulsion of, of European Jewry, to annihilationism, right, with the creation of, of death camps uh, in March through July of 1942, the Polish government in exile responded by creating something called the Council, um, excuse me, the, they, uh, through the initiative, excuse me, of uh, the Polish government in exile, again, with the, uh, the, the pressure of the two Jewish members of, of that government in London, uh, they convinced uh, and ordered, really, the government delegate to create a council for Jewish aid. It was called Zygota. Um And that was very, very important, the council for uh, Jewish aid, Zygota. And the reason is, so not only that it was one of the few non-Jewish aid organizations, uh, and their goal was to um, help Jews to get out of ghettos, to provide false papers, to provide housing, that's to say Polish homes, and they, would, they had financing from the government in exile that they could pay Polish uh, uh, families to, uh, hold, to take Jews, um, to find them work, and so forth. Uh, and they became actually quite important in saving uh, 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 Jews. One of the things they did is we believe that they produced 50,000 false documents for Jews because the Polish uh, uh, delegate and his office had a what it was called a false printing bureau that created false um, documents. So that would become an important thing. Now, why for why also is this important is that the Council for Aid to the Jews um, also had Jews in them in the leadership body. For example, Shmuel Feiner of the Jewish Labor Bund and Adolf Behrman of the Zionists were two of four members of the executive of the Zygota, the Council for Aid to Jews. So it was truly a Polish-Jewish aid organization. It wasn't just a Catholic Polish organization. And this really strengthened its legitimacy in Jewish eyes, that you had two major Jewish figures who formed half of the leadership body. Uh, and, and because of the Jews on the body, uh, more and more funds were able to be um, uh, collected in the West uh, uh, by Jewish organizations for this, this body. So that would be an important part of the what we'll call uh, the civilian part of that underground. Now I want to go to the actual military underground. This is our next chart. It's called Main Structure of the Home Army. And it just gives you a sense of that structure uh, showing there is at the top um, the the uh, commander in chief of the Polish Armed Forces, who resides in London, he appoints a a deputy commander of the Polish Armed Forces, who is head of the underground military underground in Warsaw, uh, 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 and then there is an entire structure um, of that armed forces in which, for each of the seventeen provinces of pre-war Poland are now assigned uh, 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 local commanders, they recruit, they train, and it becomes the main wellspring of resistance movement. Now, within that body also, in 1942, was created something called the Jewish Affairs Bureau, which is something very few people know about. It was in February 1942. It was basically the initiative of a non-Jewish Polish member of uh, the underground. Uh, and I'm going to now, uh, just to show you, this is the slide called Henrik Wolinski, um, who it, where he, a picture of him is shown, and uh, that's very important. Uh, now, um, uh, that Jewish Affairs Bureau is primarily an information gathering or a, a, a subdivision of the Polish Home Army, and what they ask him to do is to gather information on crimes against Jews in occupied Poland. He would gather this information, provide it to the commander of the Home Army, whose name was Stefan Rovetsky. Here's our next slide showing the picture of the commander in chief of the Home Army, Stefan Rovetsky. Um, he would provide to Rovetsky, who then, through underground channels um, uh, and wireless communication, provided that information to the Polish government in exile in London. So what we know is that um, this leader of the Jewish Affairs Bureau, um, Henrik Wolinski, faith faithfully carried out his task. And in December 1942, 
in the same year that he established the Bureau, he provided enough information for the Polish foreign mission uh, to provide uh, a text um, for the United Nations meeting uh, that took place in De on December 10th, 1942. They provided an English language uh, um, booklet called, quote, the mass extermination of Jews in German-occupied Poland. It's shown in the slide here. It is called Note Addressed to the, to the Governments of the United Nations on December 10th, 1942, and other documents. And there, in December 1942, uh, where it was now fully known about the German extermination program against the Jews, it was fully known about the uh, death camps uh, in Europe, having been reported in the Western um, um, uh, media. And here, these were texts from eyewitnesses um, with the goal of trying to uh, encourage the Western uh, powers to launch military strikes against Germany to halt the extermination. Uh, it didn't work, uh, but there's a long-lasting uh, symbolism to this um, effort of the Polish Foreign uh, Ministry. Now, what I want to do uh, at, at this point is uh, we've seen uh, the structure of the Polish underground, and now what I'd like to do is is talk um, about how they responded to um, uh, the uh, Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, um, and then um, look at Jews in the Polish underground. Now, I'm going to go to uh, the slide that talks about uh, uh, um, uh, two uh, members of the Polish underground named Joseph Wilk and Eugeniusz Morawski. Now, we should know that on the eve of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, April 19, 1943, the Polish underground military had not launched any strikes against the German occupation. Their goal was to prepare for a nationwide uprising against the Germans at the moment of, a, of the impending collapse of the German government. So sometime in the future, when Germany was losing the war, when hopefully the Western democracies were moving eastward and would liberate Poland, that was what their hope was, in the end, it was the Soviets that at the moment when, when foreign uh, allies um, approached Polish soil, the Poles would rise up in a massive uprising and they themselves would liberate Poland and they could claim uh, legitimacy as a, as a government. So they hadn't actually yet engaged in combat, open combat with the German forces. What we know is that the first open combat between the Polish home army uh, and the German forces was on the first day of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. What this slide is, is showing that a unit of the Polish Home Army in, co in collaboration with the Jewish fighting organization, Job, um, launched a strike from outside the ghetto wall against uh, German forces. Two Polish members of the underground, two 18-year-old young soldiers were killed that's this slide, Joseph Wilk and Eugeniusz Morawski. Five were wounded, and it was an unsuccessful attempt to blow up the ghetto wall. Unfortunately, as they were moving explosives to the ghetto wall, they were spotted by actually Polish blue police, and then Germans reinforced them, and there was an exchange of gunfire. But that was the first, um, first time. Now, um, the... Uh, in terms of Jewish members of that underground, I would like to discuss this topic because it's often assumed that Jews did not uh, play any role in the Polish underground, that the Polish underground was anti-Semitic, therefore they didn't accept Jews. So that's actually one of the main claims, that they had an official policy of not accepting Jews. Um, what I show uh, is, is that the Polish underground went through a shift in leadership when, and we're going to go back to one slide, when the commander, General Stefan Rovetsky, who actually was not anti-Semitic himself and actually abhorred the crimes against Jews and uh, consistently reported to, the, uh, to his commander in London about the crimes uh, in, in very, very disturbing ways, what was happening, and encouraged some kind of intervention, he, in uh, the summer of 1943, uh, was actually arrested. Uh, he was 
caught. He was considered the most wanted man in occupied Europe by the Germans. He was caught, later was sent to a concentration camp and executed in 1944. And he was replaced by General Tadeusz Komorowski, who became commander from July 1943, um, really to the end of the war. Now, in contrast to Stefan Rovetsky, who was known uh, to be a kind of center-left person in orientation, who was never known to have uttered anti-Semitic comments and just didn't seem to agree uh, with that kind of prejudice, his replacement was a member of the populist right-wing party and was known to be uh, uh, hostile to Jews. So actually we had a shift in that. Up until, let's say, this happened, there were Jews uh, in the home army. But what we do know is that afterwards, um, the Jews in the home army, there was often discouragement of accepting Jews in the home army. And we have some cases in which the commander of the home army, two documented cases, uh, encouraged his units in the far east uh, to combat Jewish uh, uh, partisans. Uh, but let's go back to actually the subject of Jews in the home army. Now, one case we have is an extraordinary case, and that is that in the, the city of Hanachuv, which was in Lvov, and here we have a slide called Jewish Platoon of the Home Army. Um, there was there a friendly Home Army commander, and he um, organized a Jewish platoon of the Home Army under Jewish command. Uh, and one of the members of that unit was Leopold Kozłowski, or Kozlowski, who passed away at the age of, I believe, 93 in Poland recently. He was a klezmer musician and uh, became what was called the last klezmer of Poland. He led actually klezmer orchestra concerts in the 1990s and first part of the 2000s. Uh, uh, during the war, he was in this region and he was a member of this Jewish uh, platoon. Uh, he happened to have a photograph uh, when I met him around 2005 and he allowed me to reproduce that photograph for my book and here it is in the slide and it's showing the Jewish platoon of the home army in Hanachuv. In that case we we have an un, a very unusual um, unique um, circumstance in which um, in which the local home army uh, was hiding we believe 250 Jews in a in this town of Hanachuv uh, in which they ordered the local population to create um, underground hiding places like bunkers. Uh, there was apparently little opposition to that. And that when the Germans entered that town in, in late 1943, early 1944, with Ukrainian helpers to ferret out the Jews, the home army ordered the evacuation of those Jews. Uh, and so as the home army was holding back the Germans, um, the local population and home armor units were helping with the Jewish platoon, Jews to flee the area. What we believe is that of the 250 Jews in that area, 180 survived the war because they were, because they were able to flee before the Germans arrived. So we have that case. Now let's go to um, the uh, case of the Warsaw um, um, ghetto. Now, and uh, the home army. So I'd like to talk about the uh, case um, of uh, actually um, two different interesting um, cases there. We have on the one have Stan Aronson, and there's a slide here. He was a Jewish member of the Warsaw District Home Army, uh, a special unit. Uh, and what is his story? Because again, it goes against that, that image that Home Army didn't accept Jews, is that he fled the the Warsaw Ghetto in January 1943. He joined the Home Army. There was a friendly commander there who knew he was Jewish. He had to have false papers and operate under a, a false uh, name, but he um, fought with the Home Army through the end of the war. He emigrated to Israel after, and I was able to sit down with him for an interview in 2005. Uh, and, and there he claimed that he never once experienced anti-Semitism in his unit even though everybody knew he was Jewish, although admitting that that was an unusual experience. Okay, now I'd like to look at another Jewish member of the Home Army in Warsaw. His name was Stan Likiernik. He was a Pole of Jewish background um, and a member of the Polish Home Army in Warsaw. Now he, for me, is a very interesting 
case because while Stan Aronson was Jewish by birth and, and remained Jewish, um, Stan Likiernik was actually had was actually born Catholic. He explains his story in his memoir that that his Jewish parents in 1920 uh, converted to Catholicism before they got married. Then they had him, and he was baptized. Now, when the war started, Nuremberg laws were extended into Poland, and he was he he who had four Jewish grandparents and two Jewish parents was fully Jewish under, under Jew, German uh, law. So he went underground uh, as a Jew in hiding with false papers, and then he joined the Home Army. Now, the, his unit of the Home Army knew that he was, had this Jewish background, and he discussed in his memoir that he was given the nickname Mordecai by his commander, who thought it was kind of funny, although Stan Likernik said it, it concerned him a lot. But for me, the one interesting aspect is he had this story uh, that he had a friendly unit, but in the first edition of my book in 2015, I'm gonna take you to one slide here, which is first edition. Um, there's an underlining in the slide. It says Likiernik in first edition. I referred to him this way. I said, among the other Jewish members of the Home Army was Stan Likiernik. Now, after my book came out, his granddaughter wrote me a uh, a letter saying that Mr. Likiernik was very upset about my book. Why? He said he's not Jewish and I should not have referred to him as Jewish. He's of Jewish background, but he's not Jewish. He was born Catholic. He belongs to a church. He li lived in London. He belongs to a church. And um, so I uh, replied that in the next edition, I would refer to him as a Pole of Jewish background. And he was satisfied with that. Now, in the in the next slide I want to show you, um, you'll see that in the first edition, I have in the bibliography a section called Jews in the Home Army Memoirs, and it includes his. So I agreed to change both of those. So when the revised paperback edition came, I'll show you here. This is the way the revision looked, and that is that I referred to, I changed that sentence the, to say that among other uh, members of the home of the home army were poles of Jewish background, and so I wanted to show you that also in the bibliography in the second edition. You'll notice that I um, uh, also uh, changed um, the uh, title of that subsection from Jewish members of the home army memoirs to Jews and poles of Jewish background, and I guess I wanted to bring that up because it 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 raises this issue about about identity. Who is a Jew and who is a Pole? Um, you know, here in America, there's, there's really no tension be between saying I'm an American and I'm a Jew. But in Poland, there were two different categories. There, was, uh, there, were, there were, we believe, about 20% of Jews in Poland regarded themselves as Poles of the Jewish faith. And, um, and then there were those who were converts knowing they were of Jewish background. So it really goes back, uh, I think, uh, to that. Now, the last um, case I will speak about um, is a, a, a case where we, we, are, we clearly see that there's an anti-Semitic bent. So, and now, in addition to the cases mostly in central Poland, in southeastern Poland, where we had friendly units of the Home Army, we also had uh, very hostile units uh, and regions of Poland where the Home Army, because of pre-war traditions, was openly anti-Semitic. I'd like to refer to the slide of Colonel Vladislav Liniarski. He was the commander the, of the Bialystok District Home Army, uh, who was openly anti-Semitic just from before the war. It was almost like arbitrary. And uh, he ordered his subunits in Ju July 1943, quote, to liquidate Polish spies, informants, and communist Jewish bands, unquote. Uh, for example, in a report prepared for the government in exile in London in that same month, he wrote, quote, the absence of Jews from trade and commerce in Bialystok is a true blessing, unquote. Now, so he was openly anti-Semitic. Uh, the other openly anti-Semitic Home Army leader was the leader of the Novo Grudek district, and now I refer to the slide with a map of Novo, Novo Grudek. Here we have the case of Colonel, and now I refer to the next slide, uh, Janusz uh, Szlowski, um, who was the commander of the Novo Grudek district Home Army. 
And by the way, it had a strong pre-war anti-Semitic tradition. It is today in Belarus. It, it also had the fewest members of the Home Army. But here, for example, in October 1943, uh, he has a report in which he, in which he orders his units, quote, to cleanse certain areas uh, of the district of what he called, quote, communist Jewish bands. In December 1943, he approved a ceasefire agreement with local German authorities in exchange for weapons that he then used to attack Soviet and Jewish partisans. Uh, so we have several of those cases. Now, in that Novogrudic district, and I'll conclude, this, cl conclude with this slide, we had a Jewish member of the Home Army in that district. His name was Abraham Melizen, and here is a slide of him. He's very unique because he came from Vilna, um, and uh, he joined the Home Army uh, um, and under a, a pseudonym. So he was known as a Polish Catholic, and there, in that form, uh, he observed widespread anti-Semitism within the Home Army, within the local population, and he left memoirs a after he passed away in 2008 at the YIVO Institute, uh, uh, and there I was able to have access to those memoirs, and he reported what we can say is kind of like widespread anti-Semitic views. He gives a, a, a very important story, which is that there's a, a, a Pole who was parachuted by the British uh, 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 Air Force into that district to help uh, to help lead the local um, uh, underground military. Um, and when uh, Abraham Mellison first met him with others, this particular leader, whose name was Lieutenant Adolf Pilk, which is the next slide, told them that he is there to mount, quote, a struggle against Judeo-communism, not against the Germans, but against, quote, Judeo-communism. And, and Abraham Melizen in his memoirs talks about how, he, how shocking it was, but how he had to conceal entirely his feelings about what was just said in a group while it was being said. He couldn't reveal that he was, he was Jewish. But that just gives you a sense that when we think geographically speaking in conclusion, what we had was a, a Polish underground that was both pro-Jewish and anti-Jewish at the same time. It had aid organizations, and it had murderers within its rank that literally ordered its underground soldiers to attack Jews, even Jewish civilians. And part of it is because we're, we're speaking about an organization that represented a cross-section of the society as a whole. It had approximately 350,000 members by 1944, uh, and they represented different geographic regions, social, political, economic, as parts of the society, um, from socialists to the to the to the right wing, both pro-Jewish and anti-Jewish uh, elements, and I think because of that, that's why there's so much misunderstanding about it, and there's a tendency uh, to generalize that it was quote anti-Semitic, when within its body we have actually um, several people who were honored by Yad Vashem as righteous among the nations. Thank you very much.